Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So um, it's fairly echoey in here, apologise for that. Um, just really to give you an update that I am working on my sword wall. Uh, so many of you have got used to the fact that I film in my garage now with the um, wooden doors behind. Um, but uh, as I promised, I am intending to create a sword wall in my study behind me here. So uh, as you can see, I've got a fairly big um, span. I just grabbed a sword uh, out of interest. This is a um, Victorian 1889 dated Wilkinson made Coldstream Guards officer's sword carried by um, or owned, purchased by an officer who served during the Boer War. And um, as you can see, hopefully what I'm intending to do is have two lines of uh, swords coming down like this. Um, I've got sort of a pretty good idea of how I'm going to do it with um, batons with uh, hooks mounted onto them. The only thing that's held me back is I've bought a few different hooks to experiment with. Now one of the tricky things with swords is that they have guards, obviously. Now the good thing with Victorian swords is that um, they tend to stick out more on one side than the other. So they tend to sit quite well against on hooks against the wall uh, because they don't have to be that far away from the wall. But unfortunately not all of them, in fact some of my favourite swords actually have more of an extension on the inside of the guard here. Um, so more equal, more symmetrical basically. And that means that they, the hooks need to be able to extend a fair way out from the wall to enable them to sit against the wall. <laughs> Otherwise you just don't have space because there's too much projecting on one side of them. And I've been experimenting with um, some different hooks. Um, obviously hooks vary in price as well. I don't know at this point whether I'm going to go with one of the production hooks I've managed to buy from a typical hardware store like B&Q or Homebase. I've got various ones. Um, or if I'm going to just go for something kind of custom made. But obviously that gets more expensive, especially when you're intending to do as many swords as I'm intending to do on the wall. I'm going to try, I'm going to try and get, I've, I've figured that I can get 14 on one side, 14 on the other side. So hopefully I'll get at least 28 swords <laughs> behind me, which will be an improvement on the roughly six swords that I had um, in my previous study behind me. Um, I do have other wall space here as well. There'll be a mixture of swords and uh, shields and uh, pictures on those walls. I've got bookshelves over there. Maybe I'll give you a tour of my study at some point. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, but there's something else I wanted to show you. So. Um, I will do a more full video about this at some point, uh, but yesterday I acquired something I've been, it's been on my to get list uh, to, for quite a while. And uh, some of you will immediately know what this is and some of, well probably most of you will not. Um, so you'll see it's a cross-hilted sword. So you might think it's maybe earlier period, but it is in fact about the same date as this sword. So it is late Victorian and um, it is what we call a handkerchief cutter. Now that's right, a handkerchief cutter sounds like some kind of special guillotine or set of scissors, doesn't it? But a handkerchief cutter is actually one of these. And for any of you who have read John Musgrave Waite's um, treatise, you will know that there are a series of sword feats. There's different types of sword feats, such as cutting lead bars. You use a so-called lead cutter sword for that. Cutting a sheep in half, it's a dead sheep, don't worry. Um, or is dead after it's been killed, uh, but then they use it for the sword practice. They don't kill it with the sword. I don't know how they kill it. Um, and so severing a sheep carcass, um, there's all sorts of different, like cutting a broomstick pole balanced on two wine glasses without upsetting the wine glass, all these kind of sword tricks. And basically what they are are sword feats. They're a way of demonstrating your ability to be versatile in the use of a sword. Um, sometimes striking with enormous force um, and, and transferring a lot of energy to the target, sometimes uh, speed and lightness of hand, sometimes a draw cut, sometimes a push cut, sometimes cutting with neither a push nor a pull. So there is the, uh, the splitting an apple or sometimes another type of fruit on a person's hand such that you don't cut the hand. This is just a simply you're splitting the fruit without a push or a pull. Yes, I am intending to do a fuller video about these sword, sword feats and actually demonstrate some of them. A lot of them are very, very cool. And whether you do Victorian swordsmanship or um, you know medieval or Renaissance, whatever, you could practice a lot of these with lots of different sharp, types of sharp sword. And this is a handkerchief cutter. So handkerchief cutters 
As you may have guessed from the title, were used for cutting handkerchiefs. And the normal way of doing this, there were various ways, but the normal way was to drape the silk handkerchief, and that's the important part. And that's the impressive part, because silk, as many of you will know, is very difficult to cut. So you drape the silk handkerchief over the blade, and then you um, cut upwards in a sweeping motion such that the silk handkerchief is severed and floats down artistically. Um, so what you need is a light, fine, very, very sharp blade. And this is sharp. Now bear in mind that this is more than 100 years old, um, so it's not razor sharp, but that is an extremely fine edge. And I think that it deserves to be brought back to where it originally would have been, um, i.e. very sharp. It's funnily enough, it's got a kind of uh, varnish over it at the moment, which is one of the things that has kind of preserved the blade in such nice shiny condition that you can see. You will notice also it bears a passing resemblance to a Chinese Jan um, <laughs> in, its, in its kind of size and proportions. And it is a very light, nimble sword. The other thing I was going to mention is that it is not only used for severing the handkerchief, it is used for other sword feats that in Waite's manual and also in Professor Harrison's manual um, and others, um, which are, for example, there's one where you have a fruit hanging from a piece of string and you cut the string and then you cut the fruit and this kind of stuff. So they're used for many, many different things. Um, and I will be talking more about this and I'll be showing a comparison with the lead cutter as well. Anyway, I'll give you more updates soon and uh, more videos. Give us a like and a subscribe and see you soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.